Presenting that tall, timid tomboy tossing terrible, terrific tantrums, telling tongue-twisting tidbits, tempting tepid titters, Tally Hassies, talking uh, tintypes, what's, 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 uh, Fred get... Allen, in uh, person. In person. <laughs> took the words right out of your mouth, Harry. You shouldn't keep your mouth open that way. People filch things out. Your bridge will be gone the they first thing They come out of know. your mouth better than they do mine, Fred. Oh, I don't <laughs> think so, Harry. Your mouth is much larger and uh, better situated, nearer the chin, I think. Well, I think we'll get to the point much sooner. Well, thank you. After this short delay, ladies and gentlemen, men at Fanta, we ran up a sign. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, your host, and this is When Radio Ruled, episode 64, People You Didn't Expect to Meet, featuring Fred Allen. Fred Allen is one of those showbiz legends. Decades of stardom. From an amateur beginning on stage 1914 until his death in 1956, Fred wrote and performed his way to success in vaudeville, became a bigger star on the radio, the lead in a handful of feature films, then early television, where household names like Fred Allen were much sought after. The Fred Allen material you are about to hear is from his radio show, Town Hall Tonight, in 1938. Fred Allen was unique in the radio world of corny, set-up, punchline-type snappy patter. His former vaudeville and current radio peers, like Eddie Cantor, Ed Wynn, George Jessel, the Marx Brothers, and others favored. Oftentimes, Fred's comic voice is compared to that of Mark Twain. All-American and homespun, wisdom disguised as jokes. Fred's wit focused on social commentary gently poking fun at the foibles and eccentricities of human nature. Fred was gruff, but mostly cheerful with a small-town attitude, advocating common sense, but tolerant of the mistakes of others. Two of Fred's greatest strengths were his ability to relate to regular people and his improvisational skill. Very comfortable going off script, and usually much funnier off the cuff than what was on the script. These two factors influenced the head writer of Fred Allen's show, a fellow by the name of Fred Allen, to put himself in situations on the radio where he could interact with people from all walks of life. And that's what you're about to hear. Fred interviewing regular, not in show business, people in a segment of his show entitled, I Know You Didn't Expect to Meet. The unexpected folks interviewed live in 1938 for this podcast are a detective that investigates crooked card games, a dancing instructor, an ice lady, a mail order physical fitness instructor, a tobacco auctioneer, and a Macy's department store Santa Claus. For any youngsters listening, the ice lady interview might need a little explaining. Uh, The refrigerator was invented in 1913, a mere 25 years before this interview. Before the fridge, homes and businesses used ice boxes, literally insulated boxes with a big chunk of ice inside as cold storage for their perishable foods. In 1938, the refrigerator, as it does now, required money to buy and electricity to run. Lots of people didn't have one or both of these resources so they kept using their ice boxes. The ice was delivered on a regular schedule by the ice man. Some ice men had freezers and could freeze their own, but most ice men continued to do it the old-fashioned way, where the ice was harvested from frozen lakes in the winter and stored in a special ice house in order to stay frozen all year round. Now that's all the exposition you need before enjoying the great Fred Allen doing what he does best having an entertaining chat with an interesting person. Uh, Harry, we're going to interview the only card detective in America today. His life is devoted to catching and exposing crooks who specialize in card games. He has recovered many thousands of dollars for gullible bridge and poker players who have unsuspectingly gambled with strangers. 
And so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet the world's famous car detective, Mr. Michael McDougall. Good evening, Mr. McDougall. Everybody calls me Mickey, Mr. Allen. Would you rather I called you uh, Mr. Mickey? Mickey? <laughs> no, uh, just Mickey. I'm more used to it. All right, and you can leave the trailer off my name, too. I won't go into what I'm used to being called, Mickey. <laughs> now, Uncle Jim tells me that you are the only detective specializing in crooked card players in the country. Is that true? Well, as far as I know, Fred, yes. It sounds like mighty interesting work. Big game hunting indoors. But tell me, what, um, what qualifications are essential to a card detective? Well, it's his job to know all of the tricks employed by card shops. Is this no Trump skullduggery, a big business? I should say so. Millions of dollars change hands every day in crooked card games and other gambling pastimes. Yes, even people tuning in on a radio program are taking a gamble. Since pasteboard conniving has assumed these proportions, I am surprised that more men aren't taking up your work. Well, Fred, to get results in my profession, you have to be able to do all of the card shops' tricks, and then some. And you can duplicate all of their nefarious mumbo-jumbo? <laughs> yes, after years of application, I find myself qualified to manipulate the manifestations of fortune with malignant dexterity. Say, I haven't heard a vocabulary get a workout like that since the day I stepped on a Harvard professor's bunion, Mickey. <laughs> but tell me, what are some of the card shop's tricks you have mastered? Well, for one thing, I can deal myself a grand slam in bridge or four aces in poker at any time. Without being detected? Why, you'd swear my deal was on the level. Where did you acquire this skill at card manipulation? I uh, used to be a magician in vaudeville, Fred. A magician? You didn't finally make vaudeville disappear, did you, Mickey? <laughs> no, not me. Well, somebody did. How did you... Uh, how did you uh, get from vaudeville into card sleuthing? Well, at first, people started to consult me about card cheats that they suspected. They'd ask you to kibitz at their games? No, they'd invite me to play to see if I could detect any card manipulation. And now you devote all of your time to it? Most of it. When I started, most of the work was for individuals. Later, I was consulted by various clubs, conventions, and steamship agencies. Well, tell me, Mickey, how does a Hoyle hooligan work on the high seas? <laughs> well, let's say that you're taking an ocean trip, Fred, uh -huh. and the boys select you as their victim. Ah, uh -uh, that is their first mistake right there. <laughs> the extent of my gambling is AT&T roulette. <laughs> That's a new game on me, Fred. Now, AT&T Roulette is dropping a nickel into a phone slot, spinning the little dial wheel, and waiting to see what number you get. <laughs> it's a gamble. I see. Well, if you did enjoy a game of cards that get you into a game and let you win steadily, they'd wine you and they'd dine you on the trip until you became great friends. And then? The very last day, you'd be trapped in several big poker pots, rubbers of bridge, or perhaps a round of red dog. And be cleaned out. Well, isn't it obvious to the player that he's being, shall we say, uh, hugger muggered? <laughs> Very seldom. I know a movie executive who lost four thousand dollars on one hand. When he was told he'd been cheated, he wouldn't believe it. It could only happen to a movie executive. <laughs> Is four thousand dollars considered a big uh, score? Not in those games. Recently, I recovered a check for fifty-one thousand dollars for a young millionaire. And I've known of a quarter of a million dollars changing hands in one crooked poker game. Well, it's hard to believe that a person with his eyes open can't detect a card shop. Well, you know the old saying, Fred. The hand is quicker than the IRT. <laughs> That's right. For instance, last week I gave a demonstration at the Cavendish Club. In a regular game? Yes, I played against two famous players with Josephine Culbertson and the Four Aces and other bridge celebrities looking on. The idea being to test brilliant play versus the shopper's tricks. Exactly. If I were caught doing anything suspicious, I was to lose the game. What happened? Well, if we'd been playing for money, I'd have finished owning the club. <laughs> Every time I dealt, I made a grand slam. How? Simple. I just dealt myself all the aces and kings. You can pick out aces and kings without even seeing them? That's right. I can recognize high cards by the feel. Well, that beats me. Well, it would in a poker game. <laughs> can all card shops do these things, Mickey, without being caught? Most of them can. Their fingers move so fast that even the slow-motion camera you can't know, detect them. I am sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt her. I saw a hyphen, and you know me, the smallest <laughs> opening, forgiven. and I'm right there. <laughs> I know an old... 
<laughs> it wasn't really a hyphen at that, Mickey. I just looked again. It's my astigmatism flattened out there. I mean. But I know an old gambler, Hot Ace Mullen. Things broke badly for him down in Florida, and he got a job as a chef. But Hot Ace, Hot Ace Mullen was a crooked heart. He used to serve a club sandwich and palm the bacon. <laughs> He was very fast. Well, uh, most card players are lightning calculators. They can riffle a deck, memorize the position of the high cards, and then deal them in their own hands. They must be an abnormal set of people, Mickey. Why, they even have their own language. What is it like? Well, suppose I tell you a little story in card sharp slang. See if you can make anything out of it. All right, go ahead, Mickey. Well, let me see. A uh, brace of broad tosses that had been hustling the Duke played bloomer after bloomer. When they were down to a Michigan BR and some please don't rain on me keisters, they threw in with a paper man, pulled their scratch, and went in for deep sea fishing. Just as soon as the sardines kissed the whale goodbye, they took a gander at the tip and picked an ump shay. He went for the pasteboards. They gave him the business for three G's. Everything was copacetic because the bees arc was no hip gee. Wow. <laughs> what does that mean, Mickey? Well, translated, it means that a sucker was gypped. Uh, well, where do you <laughs> where do you do most of your work these days? Well, bridge clubs and conventions. Then I do quite a bit of private investigating. Have you ever been called in on a political job? Political? Well, you know, as a card detective, I thought perhaps some diehard Republican might have called you in to take a look at the New Deal. <laughs> <laughs> no. The uh, only card interest that I have in Washington, Fred, is my social security card. <laughs> you didn't borrow that fellow's teeth who was on here. <laughs> but before we, before we... Before we put the conversational deck away, is there any advice you can give to our audience? Well, there are three good rules to follow to prevent being cheated, Fred. One... Don't gamble with strangers. Two... Don't gamble for high stakes. Three... Don't gamble... That is, that's excellent advice, Mickey. I resolve here and now never to make another bet. Oh, that's what they all say. I Fred. know, but not me. Well, I hope not, but something tells me you'll be betting again before you know it. Yeah, I'll bet you two bucks I never bet again. <laughs> that's all I wanted to know. Good night, Fred. And good night, Mickey McDougal. <laughs> as, you, as you know, everybody's shaggy. You know, it's about time I found out what's going on with you the said. modern dance. <laughs> and you're going to talk to a dancer. Yes, Andre. Our guest tonight is a dancer any professional dancer will tell you is the king of dancers. He's taught many of the popular stars today, and I'm going to take his word on anything that I might ask him about dancing. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet Mr. John Boyle. Good evening, John Oak. Good evening, Mr. Allen. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, where do you get that Mr. Allen stuff? You know how many, how uh, long I've known you? Now, wait a minute. I'm not that old, Fred. Now, look. When I came to New York first back in 1914, you were dancing at the Winter Garden, right? That's right, Fred. The name of your act was Boyle in Brazil, and you were starring in the passing show. You've got some memory, Fred. Memory? <laughs> Did you ever hear some of the jokes I dig up for this program? <laughs> You know, elephants hide their heads as I pass by. <laughs> but, John, New York has certainly changed since you came here from Wilkes-Barre and I came from Dorchester to test the patience of theater goers. Yes, when I first came here, Fred, the actors all lived down around 14th Street. Well, 14th Street was quite a theatrical section in those days, wasn't it? Yes, remember Tony Pastors, the Dewey, Keith Union Square? Well, that's a little before my day, John. By the time I got here, the theatrical boarding houses were all up on 38th Street, and the most popular theater was Hammerstein's. Yes, in 1914, Hammerstein's was still going strong. I, uh, <laughs> I arrived that year on the Fall River Line. You know, John, when I sat at the captain's table coming over from Boston that night, <laughs> I don't think he ever thought I'd make good. What makes you think that, Fred? Well... They kept the Fall River line running until last year waiting for me to go back home. <laughs> they could have used the business. But they finally gave up and turned the boats into lobster pots or something. Where did you live when you first came to New York, Fred? Well, I lived in a boarding house on 40th Street. Mrs. Monfort's room and board, a dollar a day. Those were the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> I had a room in that joint, John. It was so small, if you were sleeping... 
and somebody opened the door, the doorknob got into bed with you. <laughs> there was a cuckoo clock on the wall of that, in, the, in that room. Every hour, I had to get up all night long and open the window so the cuckoo would have some place to go. <laughs> You've come a long way since then, Fred. Yes. In, in 1914, I was unemployed on 40th Street. And tonight, in 1938, I'm employed on 49th Street. I've come nine blocks in 26 years. <laughs> Say, but that's not bad with traffic the way it is today. Well, it's pleasant to talk over old times, Fred, but I thought I was to be interviewed about dancing. That's right, John. I thought maybe you could give us the lowdown on what is going on in the world of terpsichore. What is it you'd like to know? Well, tell me, when did people first start dancing? Well, the Big Apple is mentioned in the Garden of Eden, or Paradise, you know. The, uh... <laughs> I have a choice there with that <laughs> line, I think. Yes, I guess, uh... I... I guess dancing is as old as man. It is, Fred, and it's interesting to watch dance styles change to reflect the tempo of life at different periods. During the gay 90s, when people took things a little easier... The waltz was popular. And the, uh, today, with people rushing from pillar to post-mortem... We have more strenuous dances like the shag. Oh, that shagging is nobody's business, John. I read about an elderly gentleman who walked out on the Florida nightclub uh, one night last week. He started to shake and jump up and down. People thought the old gentleman, gentleman was shagging. It was rigor mortis setting in. <laughs> yes, it's hard to tell St. Vitus from the Susie Q today, Fred. Well, uh, regardless uh, as to what we, um, goes on in the ballroom, the, pop, the most popular form of dancing in vaudeville has always been buck dancing, hasn't it? Yes, Fred, the buck and wing. Well, where did the buck and wing come from? The Negroes are supposed to have originated it down south. They created an entire new style of dancing? No, the form was taken from the old Irish reels and English clogs. Buck dancing has a certain form, then. That's right. At the end of every six bars, the dancer does what we call a break. Say, do you think you could give us an idea of how the buck and wing came out of the reels and clogs? You can just illustrate the tempo with your hands on the table, if you will. All right, the Irish reel went... <laughs> that was the, uh, the Irish reel, huh? Now, how did the clog go? Something like this. <laughs> now, what does a buck routine made from the reel and the clog sound like? The buck dance goes, lump them, bump them. Dum dum bum 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 break. Say that's swell. You remember when you had your school here and I started to take tap lessons from you? Yes, and you were a hopeless, Fred. Ah, uh, hopeless? <laughs> well, never mind me. Who were some of your other pupils back in those days, John? Oh, George Murphy, Joey Brown, Jimmy Cagney, Ginger Rogers, Ruby Keeler, Buddy Ebsen, Eleanor Powell. Oh, pretty little Eleanor Powell. Whatever became of her, John? I often wonder. So do I. I've said to myself a thousand times. Well, tell me, Johnny, with Vaudeville hiding around the corner to keep prosperity company, is there as much interest in this type of dancing as there was years ago? More, Fred. Pictures have done a lot to stimulate interest in dancing. Well, Johnny, they tell me you're so full of rhythm you can duplicate any dancing star's routine with your fingers. That's right, Fred. Whose dance would you like to see? Well, Bill Robinson's one of our best dancers. I wonder if you'd give us an idea of Bill's stair dance. I'll be glad to, Fred. Now, Mr. Boyle has a small doll, a miniature Bill Robinson attached to his right hand here. There are little shoes on his two fingertips, a little flight of stairs on this tabletop where the finger dance will be executed by Johnny Boyle. Are we ready, Johnny? All set, Fred. ta dum ta dum bum bum a wing at the moment. Here he goes upstairs.
Come, Bill's getting along towards the finish now. <laughs> Now, suppose we have an old-fashioned ice chest, Mr. Von Zell. Well, we got our ice from the ice... Ice man, oh, I get it. Now, you're going to interview an ice man, right? Well, you're almost right, Harry. You're just one gender out of the way. Well, not an ice lady, Fred. Yes, Harry. We are going to meet a lady who's been running a thriving ice business for a number of years. She cuts her own ice, stores it, and acts as her own middlewoman between the frozen pond and your refrigerator. And so then, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I know you didn't expect to meet Mrs. Ida Gorrington. Good evening, Mrs. Gorrington. Good evening, Mr. Allen. Well, your friendly greeting comes as a pleasant surprise, Mrs. Gorrington. Meeting a nice man for the first time, one usually expects to get the cold shoulder. But I'm not a nice man, Mr. Allen. That's right. I shouldn't have said ice man, should I? After all, you are a congealed water hostess. That's... (laughs) That's one way of putting it. Up home, they call me Ida the Ice Lady. And uh, where is up home? At Long Ridge, Connecticut. It's right outside of Stanford. Oh, Long Ridge. That's where Haywood Broom, the famous columnist, lives, isn't it? Yes. I served Mr. Broom for a long time. And how is Mr. Broom these days? I don't know, Fred. He bought a Frigidaire. <laughs> Double-crossed you, huh? Well, tell me, is your ice business confined just to Long Ridge? Yes. My father started the first ice road there, and I grew up in the business. Well, what did families do for ice before your father came to Long Ridge? I don't know, Fred. It was over 50 years ago. Well, ice wasn't so important in those days. The highball hadn't been invented. (laughs) The highball has done a lot for the ice business, Fred. Oh, I'll say it has. If all of the ice used in highballs was laid end-to-end... It would probably take Sonia Henney three pictures to skate across it. I don't know much about pictures, Fred. Well, neither do I, as you've probably surmised. (laughs) If you've seen me and Sally, Irene, and Mary. But enough about me, Mrs. Gorrington. Did you find, uh, do you find, rather, that being a woman is a handicap in the ice game? Not at all. My customers seem to like it. Oh, still, it must involve certain difficulties. Uh, You couldn't deliver ice to the Elks Club without a chaperone, could you? Any woman who can toss around a cake of ice, Fred, can toss around an elk. Uh, I I imagine you must be rather strong. Well, it isn't ladylike to brag, Fred. No, I guess there are times when even a nice lady has to hold her tongue. (laughs) You know, it's really too bad you didn't bring a piece of ice along with you. We could have put that joke on it to have it (laughs) keep for another day. (laughs) I'm sorry. You should have told me. Well, I think it's probably too late for a joke like that anyway. It'd probably be too weak to climb up on the ice. (laughs) But tell me, Mrs. Gorrington, Gorrington, where do you get your ice? Well, I cut it myself in a pond near my home. Can you cut enough in the winter to last through your busy season? Yes, I can. Store enough in my ice house for the whole year. Well, tell me, how do you go about cutting up a pond that's frozen? Do you uh, run across the ice with a hot foot and melt it in a straight line? No, it's not that easy, Fred. Well, how do you do it? First, I mark the channel, and I use a horse and plow to cut the ice. Now, when you store the ice in the ice house, doesn't it melt during the hot weather? Not much. It's packed in in with sawdust and salt hay. Uh Naturally, you expect a little shrinkage. Oh, of course. As a woolen underwear user, I understand the shrinkage problem thoroughly. I never can put on a woolen union suit after one washing. I just hang the suit inside of my shirt, you know, in case I'm rushed to a hospital or something. (laughs) You never know, Fred. How devastatingly true, Mrs. Gorrington. Now, about your service, would you mind if I asked you how you work? Not at all. Well, fine. Now, let us say, then, that I live in Long Ridge, Connecticut, and I need ice. I put my card in the window, and what happens? 
How much would ice would you want a day? Oh, I'll go the whole hog. I'll I'll take a dozen cubes. I don't cut ice that small, Fred. A wholesaler, hey? All right, then I'm a defenseless consumer. What sizes do you have? Well, I'm showing a hundred pound piece for seventy cents. 50 pounds for 35 and a smaller piece for 20 cents. Well, as long as this is an imaginary transaction, I'll take a 100-pound piece. I don't know how I'll get it into the ice box. I'll take care of that. What, you uh, catapult a 100-pound cake of ice into a refrigerator all by yourself? Well, sometimes my daughter helps me. Is your daughter a Lorelei of the solidified H2O? <laughs> If you mean she's in the ice business, yes. It doesn't look, then, as though Longridge will run out of ice ladies during this generation, does it? Not if we can help it. Have you any celebrities on your calling list up at Longridge? Well, there's Deems Taylor and Gene Tunney. You've actually supplied Gentleman Gene with ice? Yes. One time he asked me to help him put a hundred-pound cake in his icebox. Well, he's out of training now, of course. (laughs) Now, who else is on your list? Mr. Richard Gordon. The man who plays Sherlock Holmes so well on the radio? Yes, Fred. I suppose you come out of his house yelling to your daughter, saying, Quick, Watson, the ice pig. (laughs) No, Fred. My daughter's name is Emma. Well... (laughs) (laughs) Well, I thought you had been tinkering with the script. (laughs) Well, since you... (laughs) Since you look so... Since you look so contented and happy, I take it that you like your work on the ice truck? There's only one thing I like about ice, Fred. Now, what's that? It melts. <laughs> Fortunately, if it didn't, those people who make those pans to go under old-fashioned ice boxes would have been out of business years ago. And so would I. Well, as a little businesswoman, have you any complaints to register about present conditions? No, Fred, I have no kick coming. Well, you're probably in the only business that can show a profit with frozen assets. That's that's right. Well, thank you a lot for this little visit and this frosted chat. And I must say, as a nice lady, Mrs. Gorrington, you certainly take the cake. Thank you, Fred, and good night. Good night, and thank you once again, Mrs. Ida Gorrington. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet... Uh, who is it tonight, Fred? Harry, you are about to run your eyes over a perfect specimen of masculinity. A gentleman who is acknowledged to be the most perfectly developed man in the world today, and who has spent many years glorifying the great American muscle. Well, gee, maybe I can pull up a dumbbell and learn something, huh, Fred? You certainly can, Harry. And ladies and gentlemen, if you listen closely for the next few minutes, you may learn how you, too, can become strong enough almost instantly to rise up and throw your radio out of the window. (laughs) For tonight, I know you didn't... Tonight, I know you didn't expect to meet Mr. Charles Atlas. Good evening, Mr. Atlas. Good evening, Fred. You notice I call you Mr. Atlas. A fellow with your physique automatically demands an extra quota of respect. You don't have to be afraid of me, Fred. Ah, that's what you say. But those bulging muscles tell me to watch my verbal step. Say, you're certainly in fine shape. I always keep in good condition, Fred. Hey, when I look at your chest and shoulders, Mr. Atlas, something tells me that for once, Mother Nature hit the jackpot. (laughs) But tell me, how did you acquire your title, the world's most perfectly developed man? I won the title in the contest held by Bernard McFadden in 1921. Really? Boys came from all parts of the world to compete. Where was the contest held? At uh, Great Neck? (laughs) No, in Madison Square Garden. Well, did you garner any other muscular honors in competition? Yes. The following year, I won the the United States title. You won the United States title, and then the biceps became yours permanently, hey? Well, it must be wonderful to enter the world equipped with a perfect physique. I wasn't born with it, Fred. Oh, you weren't? Why, I had visions of the stalk bringing you and then hanging around outside of your house with a bent beak taking bars. <laughs> no, I was just a normal baby, Fred. Well, how did you attain your present uh, physical perfection? 
As a boy, I started doing calisthenics and exercise. Calisthenics and exercise. Did you use any equipment? No, I don't think it's particularly beneficial to work with dumbbells. No, I think that Don Wilson proves that. <laughs> He has been working with a dumbbell for over three years. <laughs> and now Don is getting so fat, when he wants to sit down, he has to get a little boy to run around in front of him to unbuckle his belt. <laughs> but I digress, Mr. Atlas. What other exercises helped you to achieve your sinewy success? Deep breathing. That's a very important. It is. You know, I haven't taken a deep breath since the time a toy balloon I was blowing up backfired in my face. <laughs> You'd better try deep breathing before it's too late. Well, you know, some of our listeners have been suggesting that. I had a fan letter only last week. It said, Alan, I'd like to see you inhale. <laughs> the, uh... the fellow spelled inhale with two L's. It was a new phonetic system. It was puzzling. <laughs> That party has the right idea, Fred. Well, I, uh, the, uh, I don't just know uh, how you mean that, Mr. Atlas, but if I don't overlook it, I'm crazy. <laughs> well, tell me, did you use any special diet? Well, I ate uh, only plain foods with plenty of orange juice and fresh vegetables. No meat? Yes, I had meat two or three times a week. I've never been this strict vegetarian. Well, I guess you can overdo anything. You know, a friend of mine is one of those uh, ardent broccoli worshippers. <laughs> he goes into a vegetarian restaurant and orders a mock sirloin made out of carrots, French fried hay on the side, and for dessert, a heaping plate of alfalfa ice cream. <laughs> He is a strict vegetarian. Yes, he is. <laughs> he even married a girl with a cauliflower ear. <laughs> he proposed to her through a bean blower. <laughs> but enough about my herbivorous acquaintance, Mr. Atlas. Do you mind? Do you mind if I ask you a few personal questions? Go right ahead, Fred. Now, what is your weight? 180 pounds. Your chest measurements? 47 inches. 17 inch neck, 33 waist, and bicep 16 and a half inches. Would you mind if I asked your age? No, I'm 45. 45. Well, you certainly don't look it. Say, while I think of it, I wanted to ask you a few things about your correspondence school, Mr. Atlas. Are you thinking of joining, Fred? Well, I might, but first I'd like to have some information. How large is your school? During the past 15 years, over 300,000 pupils have enrolled. They have? Well, I tell you, Mr. Atlas, I've been feeling as though I'm filleted lately. Do you think your health school can build me up? Just give me three months, Fred. All right. What will happen to me in three months? You'll gain 10 pounds in weight, three inches around your chest, and two inches in neck and thighs, and one inch in biceps and calf. Who is that swell-looking guy? <laughs> It is I, as of next July 27. <laughs> now, before the orchestra muscles in on our interview, you know, you we've been talking about your strength, and there are skeptics, Mr. Atlas. I get it. You want me to make good? If you don't mind. I'll be glad to, Fred. Would you like to have me bend an iron bar with my teeth? Gosh, I haven't got an iron bar with me. I always have an iron bar, and just tonight I leave it home. <laughs> of all the nights... How about driving a nail through a two-inch piece of pine wood with my hand? Well, say, I've got the nail, but I must have come out again without my pine wood. You know, I haven't got anything here in my pocket but a, a telephone book. Can you, uh, can you do anything with that? I can tear in half, Fred. You can't, this is the latest telephone book, Mr. Atlas. I just noticed Joe DiMaggio's name listed. He's back in town. Do you uh, think you can tear this? I'll try, Fred. All right, you go right ahead. <laughs> Mr. Atlas has just gone the New York telephone directory and has. Well, thank you very much. You know that you make that look so easy, something tells me that I can do it. <clears throat> Too bad we haven't got another phone book. Well, fortunately, I have got another phone book right here in my pocket. I always carry two phone books to fill out this English drape coat I have on. <laughs> now, 
if, uh, if you want, I'll be very glad to tear this in halves. It may take a little time, but I'll start in. <laughs> say, wait a minute. Your turn page by page. What did you say? Say, wait a minute. Your turn by page by page. Oh, well, if you're going to quibble about it... <laughs> I will just say thank you a lot for your little visit, Mr. Atlas, and I do wish you'd send me the first lesson in your bodybuilding course tomorrow, and as soon as something develops, I'll let you know. I will, Fred. Thanks, and good night. And good night to you, and thank you, Mr. Charles Atlas. As a man who is active in this hectic, hectic world of radio... What would you say has been the outstanding program signature or program opening brought to radio during the past year? Oh, well, that's easy, Fred, the tobacco auctioneer. Right, Harry. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet one of the tobacco industry's best-known auctioneers, Mr. L.A., or as he is better known in tobacco circles, Speed Riggs. Good evening, Mr. Riggs. Good evening, Fred. You don't uh, mind if I call you Speed, do you, Speed? No, Fred, I wish you would. You know, you sort of fooled me tonight, Speed, after listening to your delightful tobacco auctioneer chant for so many weeks on the radio. I sort of thought you'd come up here and greet me something like this. Good evening, Fred. Hello? <laughs> No, I only talk that way when I'm selling tobacco, Fred. Well, how long have you been a tobacco auctioneer? Mm, seven years, Fred. And you've been using your chant all that time? That's right. Well, tell me, Speed, why do all tobacco auctioneers use this musical call? Well, the chant is pleasant to the air, for one thing, mm -hmm. and it serves to pep up the buyers and stimulate their bidding. Well, this tobacco business is sort of a mystery to me. What procedure is followed vending the fragrant leaf? Well, first, the farmers and the plantation owners bring their tobacco to the warehouse. The buyers assemble there to purchase their tobacco, and I start the auction. Well, approximately how much tobacco will you sell during the course of a day? Hmm, from 250 to 400,000 pounds. That's a lot of tobacco, isn't it? Well, how do you manage to sell so much speed? Well, they call me speed, friend. You, mu <laughs> you must be a verbal Sir Malcolm Campbell in action. But you really don't have to talk that fast, do you? Yes, I do. The warehouse rules specify that at least one lot of tobacco must be sold every ten seconds. Well, can a buyer judge the tobacco in that short time? Easily, Fred. An experienced tobacco buyer can determine quality by feeling the leaf with his fingers. Well, do you, do you have to stop while the buyer checks up on the leaves? No, Fred. I go right ahead with the auction like this. Sixty-one. <laughs> Gosh, you were, you were a trifle too quick for me there, Speed. I was just getting my bid ready. Now, did that chant represent a complete sale? Yes, Fred. And the buyers call out their bids while you were chanting? No, tobacco buyers never bid out loud. Each buyer uses his own signal. So that no one knows who is bidding against whom? Exactly. The auctioneer is familiar with the buyer's signals. When a buyer makes a certain sign or winks at me, I know he has put in his bid. Well, I imagine it would be rather embarrassing if a fellow winked at a pretty girl during an auction, <laughs> and instead of a date, he might end up going out with 200 pounds of tobacco. <laughs> Men don't make it pretty girls down south, Fred. Well, I guess I'm slightly frayed and mid-Victorian speed. Yeah, I used to keep company with a southern girl years ago, but she caught me ordering Yankee pot roast one day. <laughs> and that broke our engagement without dessert. But tell me, how many hours a day... <laughs> How many hours a day do you work in a warehouse? No, about seven and a half. And approximately every ten seconds you sell one or two hundred pounds of tobacco. That's right, Fred. Now, in seven years, how much tobacco, roughly, do you think you've sold, Speed? Mm, I'd say our, my total runs about 50 million pounds, Fred. Fifty million pounds of tobacco sold to the tune of your chant. Mm, that's right, Fred. You always use the same chant? No, I use several different chants. But you do have one you use more than the others. Yes, ordinarily during an auction, I go along like this. 
Uh, do you vary it at times? Well, sometimes when I want to break the monotony, I add a few words like this. Look at here, come along to grab you while you can. Let's go down this road. Well, now hold it just a minute, Speed. Could you do the first chant in slow motion? You know, I think our listeners will be interested in hearing all of the in-between words that go so quickly when you are functioning at top speed. I'll be glad to, Fred. That's well. Slowed up, the chant sound this way. At $31.31.32.32.33.33.33.34.34 sold to Malcolm. Well, fast or slow, it sure has a musical quality. Have you any other variations you use working? Well, if things are lagging, I want to pep up the boys. I may break into a little tune or a nursery rhyme. Well, how does it sound with a tune or a nursery rhyme? Mm, like this, Fred. was swell, Speed. I nearly came in with my obligato there. I just <laughs> held in. Now, I know you have to hurry over to your K. Kaiser broadcast in a few minutes, and before you go, I want to thank you a lot for this little visit. It's certainly been a pleasure to take a verbal hike with you up Tobacco Road. And I've enjoyed stopping in for you. Oh, say, before you go, there's a little favor I'd like to ask of you, Speed. You know, this is my last program for the season, and I have a big tattered old joke book hanging around I won't have any use for over the summer, and I was wondering... If I would auction it off for you. Yes, B. Have you got an old dusty chant that uh, <laughs> might be used at a joke book auction? Mm, how would this be, Fred? One joke book has 34... So, to Jack Benny. Oh, God! <laughs> Can he use it? Can he use it? Well, thanks a lot, Speed. You've certainly saved the evening. Well, thank you, Fred, and good night. Good night, and thanks again, Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet... Whom, Fred? A man you aren't expecting to meet until the end of the month, Harry. The landlord, Fred? No, it's Santa Claus. Santa Claus? Oh, goody. Yes. <laughs> the only man who can get a laugh before he said anything. <laughs> the gentleman... <laughs> the g- <laughs> The gentleman I am about to interview himself interviews several thousand kiddies a day. For 11 months each year, his name is Jim Willis. But when December rolls around, he suddenly appears in Macy's toy department, where he is known as Santa Claus. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I know you didn't expect to meet that yuletide myth, that man about flu and chimney, Santa Claus in person. Good evening, Mr. Claus. Merry Christmas, Fred. Well, thank you, and the same to you, Mr. Claus. Oh, you can call me Santa, Fred. Well, that's very nice of you. I didn't want to get so intimate on first meeting. (laughs) Well, Santa, you certainly look pretty snappy in that ermine-sprinkled red jacket and those crimson plus fours you have on there. Uh, Thank you, Fred. Uh, Do you really like this suit? Oh, it's a dandy. You look like a bloodshot, good humor man. (laughs) Tell me, Mr. Willis, how did you happen to get into professional Kris Kringling? Did you have to study child psychology, take a course on Muppet IQs, or did you just want to see uh, if you looked well in a chimney? No, Fred. Three years ago, Macy's advertised for Santa Claus. Yes. Oh, there were quite a few applicants. And P.S., you got the job. That's right. Well, what qualifications must a mock St. Nicholas boast? Do you uh, have to cut a dash in Red Bell Brigands? Do you have to have a waistline like that World's Fair Perisphere? No, Fred. This stomach is padded. And like most phony corporations, it puts on a big front. <laughs> 
If the little kiddies only knew that Santa Claus stooped to abdominal taxidermy. Oh. But you're not going to tell them, Fred. No, no, Mr. Uh, uh, Santa Claus, I mean. Your secret and your mohair paunch are safe with me. But tell me, what, what other assets must a professional Santa Claus possess? Well, first I say he has to be an actor, Fred. An actor. Did you serve your apprenticeship with the Guild or the little group theater at Red Bank before you went to Macy's? No, but I spent a good many years in vaudeville. Ah, vaudeville. The dodo of show business. <laughs> I used to be in vaudeville, Santa Claus. I did a juggling act. Two minutes of juggling and eight minutes of picking things up. <laughs> I always tried to leave the stage as I found it. I know. I saw your act once, well, Fred. Uh... <laughs> I... Well, that's... <laughs> that shuts... <laughs> shuts me up, Santa Claus. What sort of an act did you used to do? Oh, singing and dancing. You know, those were the good old days, Fred. Ah, yes. The only time an actor gets to tread the boards these days is when he crosses 6th Avenue. <laughs> Good old vaudeville. I played a theater in Des Moines one time. It was so small, every time an actor took a bow on the stage, dandruff fell in the lobby. <laughs> well, vaudeville got me into Santa Claus business, Fred. And today it would take Santa Claus to get anyone into the vaudeville business. <laughs> I met a female impersonator today. He hasn't worked for two years. It's made a man out of him. <laughs> but tell me, what else, other than a stage background, uh, is essential to a department store Santa Claus? Well, being good-natured helps, Fred. Well, you certainly fill the bill. Your eyes fairly twinkle out a hearty Yuletide welcome through that chin halo of albina alfalfa you have there. Uh, does my beard really look that good, Fred? Oh, it's the most convincing jowl hedge I have ever seen. <laughs> now, what is your procedure in dispensing mass production Yule cheer to the kiddies? Well, uh, first the children are lined up in long rows before my throne. Yeah? Then I greet them one by one. You're sort of a red-flanneled Grover Whaler. <laughs> Well, do you beam and greet from nine to five each day? No. Macy's has four Santa Claus working on half-hour shifts. Gosh, even the hallowed prototype of St. Nicholas succumbs to the Wagner Act these days. <laughs> well, doesn't it uh, deflate the youngster's illusion to see a new Santa Claus coming off the assembly line on the half-hour? <laughs> The children never see two Santa Clauses at the same time, Fred. Well, it's probably just as well. They'd surely stop drinking if they did. <laughs> well, how do you... How do you escape to make your way for your stand-in? Now, when my time is up, I tell the kiddies I've got to go in and feed my reindeer. Yeah. And a few seconds later, why, the release Santa comes out. Well, isn't it confusing with three Santa Clauses milling about in that back room? Do you ever get bewildered and tell each other what you want for Christmas? <laughs> no, we're never that confused, Fred. Fortunately. Now, about your fans, do you find the children's requests have trends? Do they vary from year to year? No, the girls still want Didy or Betsy Wetsy dolls. Well, how about the boys? Oh, boys seem to be more mechanical-minded today. They ask for dump trucks and erector sets and electrical toys. Yes, kids are getting pretty tricky these days. You must get some unusual requests. Yes, I do. A little fellow came up to me yesterday and said for Christmas he wanted a million dollars. Thought you were Mr. Ickes, huh? <laughs> what did you say? I said, son, with a million dollars, you'll have plenty of headaches. Did the urchin have a reply? He said, listen, buddy... With a million dollars, I can buy aspirin. <laughs> well, that boy will be writing radio programs any day now. What do the mothers do while you're fending off their young? 
Do the mothers ever ask you for prayer for presents? No, they just ask me to make sure and give them back the right children. Well, Christmas, I'd say, is pretty tame here in New York. Have you ever seen a Christmas in Hollywood? No, I haven't, Fred. Well, I was out there last December. You know, before Santa Claus is released in Hollywood, he's previewed at San Diego. <laughs> Last year, Santa Claus came into Hollywood for a personal appearance. It was 90 in the shade that day. Santa drove down Hollywood Boulevard, drawn by two reindeer they had left over from an old Nelson Eddy picture. <laughs> Tinsel snow was falling. The crowd cheered. Santa walked up to the microphone and swooned, <laughs> overcome with the heat. I guess Santa Clausing is safer in the East, Fred. Unquestionably. I imagine that during your three years of Santa Claus at Macy's, you have talked to a goodly number of juniors. Yes, Fred. On our busiest days, we interview about 30,000. 30,000. About how many children have you greeted today? Mm, I guess around 6,000. 6,000. Well, I know you're pretty tired, Santa Claus, and I hate to ask this favor, but before you go, do you think you can squeeze in... Just one more interview. Uh, who, Fred? Well, Sandy, I don't... <laughs> she'd like to come right out. And... Oh, now, listen. You don't have to worry, Freddy, my man. I've got your Buck Rogers disintegrator. You sure? <laughs> Are you sure, Santa Claus? It's in the bag. Good night, Fred. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Jim Willis. <laughs> That was Fred Allen chatting up some interesting people in 1938. I'm Mike Gillette, your host. And this has been When Radio Ruled, Episode 64, Fred Allen Talks to People You Didn't Expect to Meet. When Radio Ruled is a Before TV production. Copyright 2023. If it isn't Portland. Yes, I came over to say goodbye. Oh, fine. Well, goodbye. Or if you're taking French leave, au revoir. <laughs> oh, I'm not going. You are. Well, I'm going. How do you know? Well, all the comedians are disappearing. Yeah, what comedians? <laughs> Jack Benny left the air last Sunday. And he left it in a pretty bad condition, too. <laughs> I heard him call you a heel on his program. A heel? Why, that broken-down movie star? I saw Benny's last picture. It looked like a passport with singing and dancing, if you ask me. Oh, it's wonderful what Jack's doing in his new picture. Oh, yes? What's wonderful? Why, Jack's hanging by his heels and making love to Joan Bennett. Hanging by it? Do you know why he is playing all of his scenes upside down? No, why? The director found out Mr. Benny's feet photographed better than his hair. <laughs> and I will bet you, Miss Portland Hopper, he has more hair on his feet than he has on his head. <laughs>